right, well this week, you know, if you've been keeping up with the Torah reading, this is a, a double portion, right? So we, are, we started in um, chapter uh, 12, isn't it? Yeah, chapter 12, and going on through 15. And when you look at, we're not really going to spend much time here, or any time really here in chapter 12, but when you look at that, it, it again, it addresses the, an issue that our modern, progressive, super intelligent, we're all getting smarter, you know, culture is really struggling with, what we've forgotten it recognizes that there is a difference between boys and girls, women and men, even from birth. And that those differences even require different things from the parents as they raise them from the moment that they are born. So even though we don't necessarily understand all of the reasons why those differences may exist, or why the days for purification are different, why they're longer for daughters than they are for sons, what we can say for sure, apparently, God expects his people to be able to tell the difference. Right when they are born, from their sons and their daughters, apparently, God has a better idea and understanding of how human nature, human anatomy works. After all, he did design us, right? Than we in our modernity, in our intelligence, can figure out. Our modern wisdom is telling us things that go against the word of God. And so we need to understand that even from the beginning, you know, this is a, this is a belief, a contrast and a conflict in belief more than anything else. And so it's a matter of faith and a matter of, of what are you going to stand on and who are you going to stand with? That's so much of where our culture is struggling and dividing. But aren't you glad that God didn't ask people in our day for advice? But I want, actually wanted to start out with in chapter 13 and the conversation about Sarat, the leprosy. Especially how this, this leprosy relates to the good news, how, he, how it relates to Messiah. Because there is a connection between the leprosy and the gospel. I know that sometimes is hard to fathom, hard to make sense of. And we, one thing we need to know that the leprosy that is here in Leviticus, as most of you probably know already, the leprosy that's here is not the, the ordinary kind of leprosy that we tend to think of in the, the modern sense, in the modern medical sense. The leprosy was understood to be revealed in the people for two primary reasons. Uh, the first one, or one of the reasons, is evil speech, Lashon Hara, right? Because of slander, lying, false testimony, even grumbling. And they, that's, that's demonstrated, that's shown in the life of Miriam out of Numbers chapter 12. That's, that's one source of the connection. You, know, you see this moment here. It says, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. So again, that's the speech, the speaking part spoke against Moses on account of the Cushite woman that he married because he had married this Cushite woman. Okay? And it says in uh, verse 9, Adonai's anger burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted up from above the tent, behold, Miriam had sarat like snow, and Aaron turned toward her, and behold, she had, he could see, it was obvious, that she had the tzarat, the leprosy. And so even though both Miriam and Aaron spoke out against Moses, only Miriam was affected with the leprosy, with the tzarat. Now, that doesn't seem very fair, does it? I mean, how many of y'all struggle with, uh, why didn't he get it too? Anybody else ask that question? See, this Torah portion here in Leviticus 13 and all of that, and Yeshua himself give the reason for all of that. Because if how many of y'all have read the, this week's Torah portion, kept up with it? Okay. Okay, if you remember when you're looking at this in chapter 13 and 14, what type of person is charged with examining the, the skin, the sore, the hair, whatever it happens to be? Who is charged with the responsibility of examining that to determine whether something is leprosy or not? 
the Kohen, the priest, right? If the Kohen, if the priest himself has leprosy or tzadarat, is he able to really make that examination? No, because he would be under examination himself. Because also with that, who is charged with pronouncing someone clean or unclean? Again, it's the Kohen, it's the priest. So how many priests do they have in this moment in Numbers chapter 12? Isn't there really primarily one? He's got his two sons, yeah, but there's primarily one whose responsibility is for all of that. And so Aaron, being that one, had to remain clean in order to be able to examine his sister, examine her. He had to be the one who remained clean in order to welcome her back into camp. He had to, he had to watch her suffer knowing that he was guilty of the very thing that she was. I mean, how many of y'all have ever gone through life where you're doing somebody, something with somebody else that you shouldn't be doing as kids, and uh, they get in trouble and you don't? Uh, a lot of times I feel worse in those moments. I should be getting just as much trouble as they are, unless it's your brother or your sister. Then you can, you can rejoice in that. But, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but if, if you know that you're just as guilty as they are and they're suffering and you're not, there's, a, there's an element of guilt that even is piled on to that. So she was having to deal with this leprosy because of this evil speech, this Lashon Hara. So that's a reason why it hits. But the real cause of the leprosy, the primary cause, is the presence of God. You know, now that the, the tabernacle has been dedicated, now that it was functioning, now that the presence of God entered into the tabernacle with the, with the cloud and the fire, he is in the heart of the camp. And it's understood that his holiness, like the, the consuming fire that he is, is bringing up all the impurities of the heart of the people to the surface. And what, had, what we think we can hide on the inside, what we think we can hide in the heart, all of a sudden, that's visible. And everybody can see the impurity that's there, appearing as spots or sores on the skin. You know, that he is essentially his consuming fire, his presence is refining his people and bringing out their impurities. And the, Peter actually refers to this in 1 Peter chapter 1 in reference to the kind of trials that we are going through. Previously, he'd been talking about the inheritance that they were receiving, the promise that they have in Messiah. But he says, you rejoice in this greatly, rejoice in that reality of the promise, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. He says, these trials are so that the true metal of your faith, which is far more valuable than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, is that your faith may come to light, may be brought to the surface may be expressed, may be seen by everyone, may be brought to light in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Messiah Yeshua. See, ultimately, this refining process is not just for you, not just a, a character builder in you, but it actually, the, the refining process in you actually is supposed to bring him praise, glory, and honor. And so even in bringing the leprosy to the surface, which is going to be quite a trial for them to endure, the goal is that sanctification. The goal is that purity. The goal is his glory. Because the disease, the unclean state, is not the way God wants us to live. The unclean state is not the way he wants us to remain. He does not want his people stuck that way for the rest of their lives or for all eternity. Because the reality is this, this leprosy, this impurity, this uncleanness, was it there even if it wasn't brought to the surface? Yeah. Even if nobody else could see it, even if you think you've hidden the secret so far down in your life that nobody knows it's there, does God know it's there? Absolutely he does. 
He could see their disease. He could see their brokenness. And his goal in revealing their leprosy was always to make a way for the people to be restored back into the camp. Those that had been excluded, those who had been uh, put out of the camp so they could be brought back in. Everything happening in these chapters about leprosy reveals the gospel, reveals the good news, the plan and purpose of redemption that God had been striving for all along. You know, even here in chapter three of Genesis, it says Adonai Elohim made Adam and his wife tunics of skin and he clothed them. Then Adonai Elohim said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So now in case he stretches out his hand and takes also from the tree of life and eats and lives forever, Adonai Elohim sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. See, in taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, both Adam and Chavab, Adam and Eve, came down with a form of leprosy. A spiritual leprosy had consumed them. It was revealed in their skin when, he, when they realized they were naked. All of a sudden that had been shown and demonstrated. And God did them a favor. Not only did he clothe them, he did them a favor by not letting them eat uh, from the tree of life. Because if you eat from the tree of life and live forever, they would, con they would live forever in that broken state. They would live forever in that state of leprosy, forever cast out from the camp. Other otherwise, they would not have the ability to be restored and redeemed if they had eaten from the tree of life. We would be like those fallen angels who live forever, but forever in that state of disobedience with no hope of redemption. So by sinning, humanity couldn't be allowed to eat of the tree of life. And so they became unclean. And just like what happens in this Torah portion in Leviticus 13 and such, they had to be put outside the camp, outside the garden. They weren't allowed to stay in there. You see this in verse 4. It says, Then the Kohen is to isolate the infected person for seven days. Verse 46, All the days during which the plague is on him, he will be unclean. He is unclean. He is to dwell alone. Outside the camp will be his dwelling. All the days while they have the plague, they're not allowed to enter the camp. As long as sin is still a part of our existence in our lives, are we allowed back in the garden? No, we're not. We're not allowed back in his presence. Adam and Eve were put outside the garden, outside the camp, until they could be made clean again. Until then, the one who has leprosy has to go and announce and demonstrate their condition everywhere they go. It says, the one with sarat, who has the plague mark, shall wear torn clothes. The hair of his head is to hang loose. He is to cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. You know, the, 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 that, where they use the plague mark here, it's the Hebrew word nega, which means like a, a blow or stroke, a sore or a wound. And it can also be used as stripes or stricken. And uh, the one who has this leprosy is to pronounce themselves. They are supposed to recognize and demonstrate and know and not because you can't really hide the fact that you are unclean. And that Hebrew word is, is tame, which means foul or polluted, defiled and even infamous. And the, the trouble is, the hard part is, is the pro every single one of us has the mark. Every single one of us has the plague. All of us are polluted and defiled. And this mark or this plague shows up on the surface of our lives, in our actions, in our words of cruelty, in our profanity. This corruption affects you know, the, the, the kind of clothes and things that we wear in the homes that we even try to build. Everything is affected by the fact that we have the plague. Everything we try to do 
is, becomes unclean. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, puts it this way. In Romans chapter 3, he says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, no, not even one. And then verse 23, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many of us have a spiritual leprosy? Every single one of us do. All of us have fallen short. We lack the glory of God. We do not produce the glory of God the way we are designed to now that we are broken, now that we are in this fallen and sinful state. But remember, what are our trials, our infection, you know, what, what does our infection result in once we have been made clean, once we have been allowed to return to the camp and return back into God's presence and return back to the garden? What are those trials supposed to do? We've fallen short of the glory of God, but our trials are supposed to do what? Bring him praise and glory. This has been the plan all along. Even though our sins are as what? Are as scarlet, right? Our sins are as scarlet. They shall be made what? White as snow. Our sins are as scarlet and they keep us separate from the presence of God that's now in the heart of the camp. We're not allowed to return until we are made clean. And thankfully, you know, this chapter is more about bringing the person back into the camp. It's anticipating and hoping that they will be made clean again. It's more about that than it is about keeping them out. Leviticus 13, verse 6 says, The Kohen is to examine him again on the seventh day, and behold, if the plague has faded and has not spread in the skin, then the Kohen shall pronounce him clean. It is a scab. He is to wash his clothes and be clean. And these statements are throughout the chapter. You know, God never wanted anyone with leprosy to stay in their state of leprosy. He never wanted them to stay out of the camp forever. It's always supposed to be short term. It's supposed to be temporary. It's, there's supposed to be an end. The, the situation, the condition is supposed to bring them to repentance. So they will return. And you know, you'll notice, we'll come to this again in a little bit. How does, what does the Kohen do? The Kohen recognizes that they are clean, right? He pronounces that they are clean. Can the priest, can the Kohen make them clean? No, he cannot. The Kohen cannot make them clean. He can only recognize that he has become clean. Because the belief is, the understanding is, the interpretation is that only the Messiah has the power to make clean someone with leprosy, clean. But again, these statements are throughout the chapter. It's supposed to come to an end. But for that to happen, for them to be brought back into the camp, one who is allowed in the camp, this is, this is the amazing thing. For this process to work, that is laid out here in chapter 13 and 14, for that process to work, one who actually is a part of the camp, one who is allowed in the camp, is supposed to leave the camp and go outside and meet with the one who is not allowed in the camp. You look at that in Leviticus 14, verse 1. He says, Then Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, This is the Torah of the one with Tadarat in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the Kohen, to the priest. And the Kohen is to go to the outside of the camp, the Kohen is to examine him, and behold, if the mark of Tadarat is healed in one with Tadarat, whoop, okay, I was going to stop there. If the mark is healed, so the, the priest is in the camp. The person with leprosy is supposed to go to the camp. But most importantly, in order to be redeemed and to, to be restored, in order to be made or in, again, declared clean, the priest has to leave the camp and come to meet with them. Leave, essentially, 
that, that designated presence of God and go where there is uncleanness outside the camp. And again, how does that describe, how does that, how is that connected to Yeshua himself? In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we looked upon his what? His glory. The glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. By becoming flesh, Yeshua is leaving what? He's leaving the presence of God. He's leaving the camp. He's leaving the garden in essence. And he came to dwell with us outside the camp. He is tabernacling outside here with us. But because Yeshua is without sin, because he, was, he is therefore clean, he did not have the disease of sin, what can his life produce toward the Father that we cannot in our brokenness? You know, all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? But because he doesn't have that sickness, that disease, he can still give glory at all times. But he leaves from where he is and comes and joins us. John 3.13 says, No one has gone up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man. You know, because of our leprosy, our sin that is revealed by the holy presence of God, you know, we are not allowed to re-enter the camp. We cannot go up into heaven. We're not allowed. We cannot return to the garden. Instead, the Son of Man, the Messiah, comes down from God's presence. And then we must go to him. Says in John chapter 6, he says, Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone coming to me I will never reject. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Why should those with leprosy come to him? Because he, not only can he pronounce them clean, Right, as a priest in the order of Melchizedek, as, as Hebrews talks about, he can actually make them clean. He can heal them. John the baptizer, he calls Yeshua the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And not only, he can, he, not only can he take away their sin, he can take away our leprosy. The great thing about the whole thing is he is willing to do that. In Matthew chapter 8, we, we looked at the Luke ver passage a little while ago. Matthew chapter 8, he says, And a man with tzadarat, with leprosy, came to him and bowed down before him, saying, Master, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Yeshua stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I am willing. And be cleansed. And immediately his tzadarat was cleansed. And even though Yeshua is the one who did the healing, did the cleansing, even though he is the one who has the authority and the power to make someone clean, he also understands that he's outside the camp. That his place, his authority to do so is not recognized by those who don't recognize who he is. And so he tells these, even though all those with leprosy, to honor the Torah honor what's happening here in Leviticus 13 and 14, Yeshua says to him, see that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the Kohen and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Because they're going to ask him, okay, well, what changed, right? What happened to you? That, because you've had leprosy all this time for however long, and now it's gone, now it's changed. What happened? And what would he tell them? I met someone. I met the Messiah. And he healed me. When you think about that, when he says, offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony, what does the Torah say? Leviticus 14 then the Kohen is command that two clean living birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop, be brought 
for the one being cleansed. And the Kohen shall command them to kill one of the birds in a clay pot over living waters. Now, many of y'all may have seen or seen all the different things that are said about these three, three things that are involved here. Um, interestingly, they, they are the same things that are mentioned surrounding the offering of the red heifer in Numbers chapter 19. I mean, that's a pretty big, big deal. These three items, the cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. You know, and scarlet, what that's just talking about is, is largely just cloth that's been dipped in this uh, coloring, this dye, to make it look like what? Scarlet is the color of blood, is it not? So these are the same things that's mentioned in the offering of the red heifer. Hyssop, you know, was, was the thing that was used to paint the doors at Passover. It was also used by the Roman soldiers to offer Yeshua the, the vinegar wine as he hung on a plank of wood after he had been beaten and scourged to where his whole body was covered in scarlet, in blood, wrapped in those royal robes, wearing a royal clown, crown. It says, then Pilate took Yeshua and had him scourged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in this purple robe. In verse 29, it says, a, a jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they put a sponge soaked with the sour wine on a hyssop branch and brought it to his mouth. And when Yeshua tasted the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Do you remember these words from earlier? These ones for uh, a blow or stroke, sore wound or stripes or stricken. And these are for foul or, well, let's hold off on that. The blows, the, the strokes, those open sores and wounds that cause the blood to flow caused his body to be striped with all those different kind of whelps to the point that he was considered stricken and abandoned. You know, he became foul and polluted and defiled and unclean, one from whom men turned their faces. It's as if Yeshua came down with a case of leprosy. and had to be taken outside the camp. You know, there are many rabbis and commentaries, even in Jewish literature, that refer to the, the leper Messiah. And that's connected to the blows and the sores of leprosy and the words that are used in Isaiah chapter 53. If you keep that word here, especially, uh, the negah there, it says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, one from whom people hide their faces. And he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our pains, yet we esteemed him stricken. And again, this was the 5061. This is the root of it. We esteemed him stricken, struck by God, and afflicted. Verse 5, you know, he was pierced because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement for our shalom was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Verse 8 is where the connection is primarily made. It says he was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck, that's the negah, because of my people's rebellion. Verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased Adonai to bruise him. He caused him to suffer. If he makes his soul a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the will of Adonai will succeed by his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous and he will bear their iniquities. See, it's, it's the leper Messiah that carries the sins of the people. He's the one that brings healing and cleansing and the will of Adonai will succeed. Will be accomplished 
it will be finished. But even more than the hyssop, you know, this is, if, if that's not enough of connecting the, the hyssop, the scarlet, and the wood, is the two birds themselves. You know, one of them is the one that is killed and the other is set free. In many ways, both of these can be understood as Messiah, as seen in Jewish thought. One bird, the one that suffers, the one that is killed, is Messiah ben Yosef, the son of Joseph, the suffering servant. The second bird is like Messiah ben David, the ruling king. Remember, look at this passage. The Kohen is to command that two clean living birds... Cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop be brought for the one being cleansed. The Kohen shall command them to kill one of the birds in a clay pot over the living water. The, the, the clay pot on one hand you know, is taken from where? It's, it's clay pots taken from the earth, the land that's receiving the blood and collecting it. On the other hand, the clay, how, how does scripture talk about humanity and how we are created in the first place? Do they not take from the earth? The, the body of this human being, we are made from dust and formed as a potter molds clay. In Rabbi Shul, Apostle Paul, he refers to humanity that way in Romans chapter 9, that the, the potter has the right to make from any lump of clay the instruments that he chooses. So in that clay, this, this blood and living water are there collected in that clay vessel. Yeshua in the flesh also call, is, calls himself you know, refers to all of the living water that he is able to provide. In John chapter 4, in a conversation with a Samaritan woman, he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who, it is who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. He is claiming to be the source of the living water. He says in verse 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty, the water that I give him will become a fountain of water within him, springing up to eternal life. Then again in chapter 7, during one of the feasts, during the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, on the last and the greatest day of the feast, on the, of the feast uh, Yeshua stood up and cried out loudly, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The first bird is like this. It's slain. The earthen vessel of his body is broken. It's pierced and blood and water come forth. The blood and the living water mixed together in this clay vessel. And this happens. The first bird dies for the one being cleansed. That's why it's dying. But notice what happens to the second bird. As for the living bird, he is to take it, the cedar wood, the scarlet, and the hyssop, and dip them with the living bird into the blood of the bird that was killed over the living water. He is to sprinkle on the one being cleansed from the tzarat seven times and pronounce him clean, then release the living bird over the open field. The wood, the scarlet, the hyssop are dipped in the blood and living water along with the second bird, the one that represents the Messiah ben David, ben David. One of the more interesting descriptions of the return of Messiah is that his robe is dipped in blood and turned scarlet before the battle even begins. So Revelation 19, he says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one riding on it is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes are like flame of fire, and many royal crowns are on his head. He has a name written that no one knows except himself. And he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. 
know, we've been looking at those things in, uh, in the Targums. And that's one of the, the ref- references to Messiah on many occasions is the reference to him as the, the Memra, the Word. The returning Messiah is that second bird dipped in the blood of the first. And then he's set free. Free to go anywhere on the earth as a testimony of the cleansing from sin to the testimony uh, of, to the victory over sickness and death that has occurred. This is Messiah, the son of David, going forth to rule and to drive out all the leprosy from the earth. And he promises when he does that to give his people, those who come to him in faith, new robes to wear that are not tainted and corrupted by the leprosy, which is what happens in this chapter, is this section as well. And he also promises to give them a new home in the father's house that he has prepared. You know, all of that glory, all of that hope that we have in Messiah Yeshua, the the, the diagnosis of our uncleanness, the exclusion from the camp, everything, the mechanism of our restoration is all right here in this Torah portion. And it's in many ways hidden in the parts of the Torah that make us the most squeamish, right? Right? that we think is gross, that we skip over, we don't like reading this part. And yet the good news of our salvation is right here. And that's not even getting into how the cleansed leper on the eighth day is supposed to offer the lamb, how the cleansed leper is treated essentially like a priest, practically anointed with the blood being put on his right ear, his right thumb and his right toe and on his head. All that kind of stuff that happens with the priests. But this is the Torah for the one who has the mark of Tzadarat, for the one who has that leprosy, that spiritual sickness, that spiritual sin, a mark that we all have and we all need cleansing from. And so because we have the sickness, because we have the disease, we have to go and show ourselves to the priest. The one who left the camp, who left the garden of God's presence. We must come to the Messiah, the leper Messiah himself, in repentance and be cleansed and covered by the blood of the Lamb in order to be restored to the camp of God's presence. And so so that makes what all the trials, all the difficulties, all the hardships that we go through, all the things that we have faced, faced, If we don't go to him, then none of those things will result in praise, glory, and honor when he is revealed. But if we do go to him, then all of those difficulties, all of those hardships, all those things that we can look back on our lives and say, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? If If we go to him, then those things, even those things that we hate the most, can result in praise, glory, and honor. When Yeshua is revealed. That is the promise. That is the future that we have to look forward to. And that is how we will be cleansed and made whole and brought back into the camp.